All right, we are ready to go. So what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to continue our look at uh, Chapter 9. Uh, but today we are going to focus uh, almost exclusively on the issue of punishment. Now, as we're going to see, unlike reinforcement, uh, punishment, uh, while effective, while a contingency that does lead to a change in behavior, uh, it does come with a lot of side effects um, and a lot of issues that you need to be aware of if you are going to go into using uh, punishment. So that's what we're going to take a look at uh, today. We're going to take a look at the different types uh, of punishment, problems with the use of punishment. There's actually also benefits uh, with the use of punishment. And then we'll end it with, if you are going to use punishment, what is an effective way uh, to make sure that it's implemented so that it's as effective as possible and as um, uh, as, li as little harm as possible uh, is done. So we are going to take a look at uh, all forms of punishment. So punishment has long been used as a way of changing behavior. So uh, back in the day, uh, children were punished by spanking in order to make sure that they behaved appropriately. Today, mostly, most people have largely given up on spanking in favor of uh, timeout. But we're going to take a look at punishments like timeout punishments, like uh, taking away a specific uh, treasured item, for example. So if your child uh, says a bad word, you might take away their toy uh, as a means of punishment. We're going to see some of the side effects of punishment, uh, why you might not want to use it uh, in order to help uh, children play more appropriately together. Punishment might not be uh, a good way to do that. We'll take a look at, uh, for all of you uh, who are going to be bosses in the future, why uh, using punishment at work can be very, very uh, detrimental. And on that note, we are having videos today, so let me just get that all ready to go. And uh, we'll take a look at uh, some pretty extreme forms of punishment. So if anybody remembers the uh, Rodney King beatings or if anybody has ever learned about that uh, in your uh, history classes, I guess, for, for all of you now. Um, uh, we'll take a look at uh, what form of punishment that was and how does police brutality ever get to that uh, level to begin with. And we'll also tie this into uh, domestic violence, um, interpersonal, uh, you know, sorry, intimate partner, uh, violence and domestic abuse. And uh, I'll just, a quick little aside while, uh, while we're gearing up uh, for today, I'll just mention that um, it, it's very interesting when I'm putting together these, uh, these videos and these uh, PowerPoints to take a look at uh, the images that uh, I find on certain, uh, on certain uh, topics and uh, just some of the inherent biases that you will find uh, online. So, for example, when I looked for um, domestic violence, uh, just about every image was of a uh, woman uh, that was being abused. And uh, the only images of uh, males suffering domestic violence were images indicating that, yes, it indeed happens to males. And this is just something that I thought I'd bring up uh, in our preparation, or maybe your preparation for International Men's Day coming up November uh, 19th. Um, there is a need to bring awareness. I can see a lot of faces in this, uh, confused faces looking at this. There's a need to bring awareness uh, to issues facing a lot of males today uh, in our society. There's an International Men's Day. Do you know when the most Google searches for International Men's Day occurs? Monday. Anybody want to guess? Day after. No. On International Women's Day, because on International Women's Day, there's a lot of media coverage about International Women's Day, and men who are suffering through their issues all of a sudden are wondering, why is there no International Men's Day? They don't know. There is an International Men's Day. So part of what I went through, uh, I, came, I went through in terms of my mental uh, disorder, in terms of depression, occurred because I am a male living in this society, and male, males are treated in a certain way. And one way that we're treated is to think that we're always, for some reason, in control. And as it turns out, we are not. So men are often abused in uh, domestic uh, partner situations. And uh, the, um, the incidence 
uh, varies in terms of what that proportion is. But if we take a look at uh, the National Domestic Violence uh, Hotline and studies that they have done, um, if you take a look at who in the United States has been the, vi the victim of severe physical violence by an intimate partner in their lifetime, we get one out of four women and one out of seven men. So if you take a look at the percentages of who is uh, abused in these domestic situations, uh, over one third of all domestic uh, abuse cases are males being abused. And uh, it's just not something that is very often brought to mind or brought to light. So I just thought I'd point that out. Um, and again, the statistics uh, are, um, it's kind of hard coming across really reliable statistics on this because oftentimes the sources that you go to, this is where your critical thinking skills really have to come into play because some of the sources that you go to are clearly biased one way or the other. That's one of the reasons why I went to the National Domestic Violence Hotline because they seem very impartial. But again, it's just this idea of males being the invisible victim. And uh, on this one here, uh, we actually have that more men than women were victims of intimate partner physical violence in 2010. Uh, according to the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, 53% of victims of that, uh, domestic violence, or sorry, intimate, pers um, intimate partner violence were males in 2010. So, yay equality, I guess, but not the right way to go about that. Uh, but anyways, just thought I'd bring that up uh, because uh, it does occur on both sides. And today, we're gonna see how does this, uh, how does this escalate? So one of the kind of patterns of um, inter, uh, intimate partner violence is that it usually starts off small, right? It usually starts off with a little bit of physical violence. It usually starts off with a little bit of emotional violence. And then it escalates from there on in. So we're going to see how does that escalation occur because what intimate physical uh, violence is, in its essence, is this punishment. You've done a behavior and your partner is going to punish you for that. And as we're going to see, that escalation is a built-in side effect of just the punishment procedure all on its own. All right, so PSA over, let's get back to um, the psychology of it all. All right, so when we were taking a look at the contingencies, the four types of contingencies, positive versus negative, reinforcement versus punishment, uh, we mostly focused on reinforcement. Today we're gonna focus on punishment. So we have positive punishment, punishment where something is presented uh, so, for example, spanking would be positive punishment. Uh, the behavior decreases, that's positive punishment. Uh, negative punishment, something is taken away. Uh, timeout would be a form of negative punishment. Behavior decreases, that is negative punishment. So let's start off on uh, positive punishment. So as I mentioned before, spanking, for example, is an example of positive punishment. So the child does a particular behavior. The consequence of that behavior is that pain is presented to their behind. And as a result of that, the behavior decreases. We've also seen positive punishment used in the treatment of Harry. So when uh, Dr. Fox got right up into Harry's face and said, if you, uh, you know, get into my face, I'll get into your face. If you come to close to me, I'll come close to you. That's a positive punishment. Because if Harry got close to his face, Dr. Fox presented his face to Harry, presented an additional uh, stimulus to Harry's world. That led to a decrease in the close talking. That's an example of positive punishment. And when we're talking positive and negative punishment, this is where you really need to uh, keep in mind what positive means and what negative means. So positive means something is presented, negative means something is taken away. And in the Rodney King beatings, incidentally, is, is anybody familiar with the Rodney King? Okay, so you'll learn a little bit about it uh, today. It's, it's uh, famous because this was one of the first, if not the first, oh, full screen mode is not available. Let me try this, refresh. So this is one of uh, the first, if not uh, the absolute first um, instance of police. Watch this on YouTube. All right, we can't get this full screen. 
But anyways, this is one of the first instances of police violence that was caught on, uh, caught on tape. So this is Rodney King right here, and he was pulled out of his car, and he was subdued. And let me just... So right about here, right about here in this nine-minute video, Rodney King has been subdued. So I don't know the details of why he was pulled over. I don't know the details of everything that uh, uh, led to this instance. But right here, he is clearly subdued, clearly able to be taken in to be arrested, should be finished, should be put into the car, and away you go. Unfortunately, that was not the end of it, and Rodney King continued to be... Oh, the FBI doesn't want me to... See. <laughs> This is actually on the FBI page. All right, so yeah. So this was one of the first videos that ever got caught on this. This is, this is way before, uh, this is 1991. So this is way before smartphones. This is when somebody actually had to have a camcorder that they just happened to have in order to film this, uh, this incident. So this is an example, and the, um, I'll post a link so you can watch the entire thing if you so desire, but this is an example of where it's very important to remember what positive means and what negative means and what punishment means because what these police officers are doing to Rodney King, as we're gonna see, is positive punishment, okay? So remember, positive is in no way an endorsement, in no way of saying that it's a good thing to do. If something was presented, in this case, batons um, and uh, other you know, he was kicked, he was uh, beaten with batons. That was presented to decrease a particular behavior. That is positive punishment. Incidentally, for those of you that uh, are unfamiliar with the case, they did uh, eventually uh, go to jail. So these four officers, two of them eventually went to jail. So you can imagine just the debacle uh, that was around this. But just so that you know, after that footage was aired, after the first trial, I have this written down because it's kind of unbelievable, the jury actually acquitted all four officers of assault and acquitted three of the four of using excessive force. Uh, the jury could not agree on a verdict for the fourth, op fourth officer uh, charged with using excessive force. So the four, whoops, the four officers that were involved in this uh, beating here on the first trial through they were acquitted of using, um, they were acquitted of assault. Three of them were acquitted of excessive force. So three of them were, were decided, no, that wasn't excessive. And then the fourth one, they couldn't agree on a verdict. They couldn't agree, I guess, how excessive uh, the force was. So that occurred. And I bring that up because that lack of um, a, uh, a verdict actually led to more positive punishment. So that lack of a verdict led to the infamous LA riots. So after that verdict came out, Los Angeles just lost it. And there was riots going on in Los Angeles. There was looting in stores. There was fires being set. Uh, it was bad. Uh, 25 dead, 572 injured, 1,000 blazes uh, reported. The city just lost, uh, lost it. And this was an example of a group in a, enacting positive punishment on, in this case, the city of Los Angeles. And they basically said, you know, the verdict of not convicting these individuals, this miscarriage of justice, the consequences, we're going to present something. We're going to present blazes. We're going to present uh, um, injuries. We're going to present... Uh, looting, and that actually did change the, uh, the outcome of the trial. So that was positive punishment, and uh, we'll see the outcome of the trial and just, sorry, the outcome of the LA riots uh, in just a little bit, but um, this is a rough, uh, rough lecture so far. All right, so let's switch it up a bit. Negative punishment. Negative punishment uh, is still punishment, behavior still goes down, but in this case, you're taking something away. So negative punishment, you don't present anything, you take something away, but the behavior still decreases. So timeout is a uh, typical form 
of negative punishment that is used very often. The child does something, they write on the walls. The, behavior, the consequence of that is that something is taken away. Their freedom, their mobility, uh, their TV time uh, is taken away. That is negative punishment and it decreases that particular behavior. Uh, negative punishment was also a result or also came uh, as a result of the Rodney King uh, trials because after the riot, after the positive punishment, where there was a miscarriage of justice, and that led to the consequence of fires and looting and, and murders and rioting, uh, that actually led to a retrial of these four individuals. And on the retrial, uh, the jury found Officer Powell and Officer uh, Kuhn guilty. So this guy and this guy were found uh, guilty, and they were subsequently sentenced to 30 months in prison uh, Wind and um, Briseno were acquitted of all charges. So even after the riots, even after the video footage, uh, two of them went to jail. But jail is negative punishment. You do something, your freedom is taken away. That's a negative punishment, hopefully indicating a decrease in that particular behavior. All right. So those are the types of uh, punishment uh, the two major contingencies of punishment. And then negative punishment is also uh, subdivided into two separate forms of punishment, being timeout and what's known as response cost. And these two differ primarily in degree. Um, so don't get too tied up if you can't exactly know which one is which in a particular situation. Uh, but we'll say what their sort of dictionary definitions are so that you're aware of the concept. Uh, of timeout and response cost. So timeout is a negative punishment, form of negative punishment, and that's where you lose your access to all positive reinforcers for a brief period of time. So you lose access, what's taken away is your access to positive reinforcers for a specific period of time, uh, and that's your uh, uh, consequence uh, for your particular target behavior. So this would be an example of what is typically thought of as timeout. When a child says, oh, I got placed in timeout, when they got placed in that timeout chair, that is a loss of all positive reinforcers, loss of positive reinforcement for a particular time. Uh, jail sentences are timeout. You literally get a timeout from society. You lose all your positive reinforcers for a particular period of time. So that is the timeout version of negative punishment. We also have the response cost version of negative punishment. And the response cost version is where you remove a specific reinforcer. So it's the loss of a specific reinforcer following the occurrence of that problem behavior. So not all reinforcers, it's not a general loss of your ability to get reinforcers. It's a loss of a specific reinforcer. So if you have a child and they have a favorite toy and they do a behavior that you want to decrease, so let's say that they drop an F-bomb during Thanksgiving dinner and you don't want that to occur in the future, you might take that toy away. You're not putting them in timeout. It's not like they don't get to eat food. It's not like they don't get to still you know, hang out with the family. You're not removing all reinforcers, but you take that one toy, you take that little Smurf car down there, and that is the... Uh, that is the response cost version of negative reinforcement. Hopefully, the swearing will decrease. Uh, and the reason that I mention uh, that it's sometimes difficult to know uh, which one is which has to do with the degree of how many reinforcers are lost. So, for example, in Harry, his five minutes of timeout uh, from restraints, sometimes that's a little bit difficult to understand what's going on here because. Is it response cost? In which case you've taken away the restraints, you've taken away a specific reinforcer, or is it actually timeout where you've taken away access to all reinforcers? So sometimes it's a little bit difficult to know. In actuality, this one I believe would fall more into the timeout uh, condition because not only did Harry lose access to his uh, restraints as reinforcers, but Dr. Fox also left which means that there was no Coke, there was no pretzels, there was no good boy Harry's, uh, there was none of that. 
but uh, it sometimes is difficult because uh, you know as soon as you go past that one very specific reinforcer, do you get into timeout when it's an access to uh, positive reinforcers in general? Uh, it is on a continuum, so that bright boundary doesn't actually necessarily exist. But just keep that concept in mind. You lose a specific reinforcer, response cost. Lose all reinforcers, that's timeout. Uh, if you commit a crime and you get fined, that's response cost, right? They're just taking away one reinforcer. They're taking away some money. If you get sent to jail, that's timeout. They're taking away uh, all your reinforcers. So keep that idea in mind in terms of the different types of uh, negative, negative punishment. All right, any questions on that? Okay, so moving on. We've taken a look at uh, the different types of uh, punishment. Uh, we've taken a look at negative punishment, positive punishment, uh, things like timeout um, in terms of uh, negative punishment. Uh, and these sorts of things uh, are general uh, outcomes of punishment. So timeout works for children, timeout works for adults. Um, other examples of negative punishment uh, that we've seen uh, with uh, Dr. Fox's treatment of Harry, he also did negative punishment for the uh, close talking. So positive punishment was if Harry got into Dr. Fox's face, Dr. Fox got into Harry's face. Harry got into Dr. Fox's face, Dr. Fox got into Harry's face. Presenting something, behavior goes down, positive punishment. In the other cases, when Dr. Fox was talking and Harry got into his face, Dr. Fox, like in this example, stopped talking. So he would be talking and then as soon as Harry went put his face back, he would start talking again, but as soon as Harry's face was close to him, right, he kept doing that. That's an example of negative punishment. So he was talking, Harry did the behavior, talking was taken away uh, until Harry took his face away. Negative punishment, something was taken away, close talking went down. So we've seen the two different types of punishment. Uh, and uh, as you can imagine, and you would be correct, there are problems inherent with the use of punishment. Punishment is a very dangerous contingency to use to change behavior. Whereas reinforcement has its own side effects, but these side effects are the kind of side effects that you're glad that they occur, right? It would, it would be as if you take a, a pill for, um, uh, you're on an antibiotic, and they say, oh, there are side effects. And you're like, wow, what are the side effects? And it's like, well, this pill is going to also increase your IQ by 10 points while you're taking it. You're like, well, great, yeah, it's a great side effect. Those are the kind of side effects that positive reinforcement has, or negative reinforcement has. They have those good side effects. Punishment has some bad side effects. So you need to be aware of these problems of punishment, these ones that are associated with punishment. They're not found in reinforcement. So that if you do make the decision that punishment is required, the same way that Dr. Fox made the decision that the way that we're going to have to treat Harry is we're going to have to use a punishment procedure, um, you know, make sure that you know the problems associated with it and deal with those accordingly. So, problems associated with punishment. Problem number one, punishment of an inappropriate behavior does not necessarily strengthen the appropriate behavior. So uh, if you punish somebody who swears, that's not gonna immediately make them more polite. If you punish somebody who is uh, physically uh, abusive, that's not necessarily gonna make them more um, emotionally uh, uh, giving. So the punishment of a behavior doesn't necessarily uh, strengthen the other behavior or the corresponding opposite behavior. And importantly, it can actually lead to a general suppression of behavior. It can actually lead to an individual basically saying, well, if I can't do this, I'm not gonna do anything. So this is why punishment is not a great idea necessarily if you're trying to get your children to play well with each other because the one thing that you want is you want them to play well with each other. So let's say that one of your children is in sharing and you wanna teach him it's appropriate. Sharing is good, you wanna be able to share. If you punish that child for not sharing, that is not necessarily going to increase the amount of sharing, right? So first off, 
It's not going to necessarily increase the amount of sharing. And it could lead to a generalized decrease in just behavior in general where this child stops playing with their sibling. So by punishing the uh, behavior of not sharing, you actually led to what you didn't want, which is them not playing together at all anymore. So you lead to that decrease in general behavior. So that's one side effect to be aware of. It, doesn't, it, will, it will definitely decrease the occurrence of a behavior, but it doesn't strengthen that opposite uh, behavior. All right, problem number two. Punishment, uh, the person delivering the punishment. This is a big one. The person delivering the punishment becomes a discriminative stimulus for punishment. So the person that actually has to enact the punishment then becomes that discriminative stimulus for punishment and the result is that sometimes that unwanted behavior only occurs uh, or is suppressed uh, when that person is present and then occurs when they're not present. So rather than the behavior decreasing, the behavior uh, stops in the presence of the discriminative stimulus for punishment and it pops right back up uh, as soon as that individual is no longer around. So this is uh, the basis of one of those classic stories of the parents that are going in for that parent-teacher interview, right? So they have that parent-teacher interview and they're sitting there and uh, they're thinking to themselves, uh, you know, we're going to go in, we're going to go talk to our student about little Jimmy. We're going to, sorry, talk to our teacher about little Jimmy. And they walk in there and they're like, all right, tell me about little Jimmy. How does, how's he doing? And the teacher's like, oh my gosh, little Jimmy, what an angel. So well behaved, so polite, so nice, so courteous. You guys should be very proud. You know, he's an absolute angel. And they're thinking to themselves, are you sure you're talking about little Jimmy? Because little Jimmy is a terror. Uh, he's, he's like impolite. He's complete opposite of what you're saying. And uh, the reason that this is occurring is because the teacher implemented a punishment contingency for those behaviors. She then became a discriminative stimulus for punishment, which meant that instead of increasing these behaviors, she got rid of them, but only at school, only when she herself was present as that discriminative stimulus for punishment. And as soon as Jimmy got home, all the other bad behaviors occurred, uh, and uh, he basically uh, had none of those good behaviors uh, carry over. So this is something that should be, um, that, sh that you should keep uh, at the forefront of your mind. Because I would imagine that after many of you graduate here, you'll probably get into positions of authority. You'll probably be people's bosses or supervisors. And you want to make sure that you do change your employee's behavior in the correct ways. But be very careful with the use of uh, punishment because if you punish as your primary method of changing behavior then the behavior that you're after will be present as long as you're present and it'll be gone as soon as you're gone so unless you want to have to micromanage your employees every single minute of the day try not to use punishment techniques to change their behavior Otherwise, they're only ever going to do that behavior while you're present. And as soon as you're gone, they'll say to themselves, oh, thank goodness, go back to whatever it was they're doing. And as soon as you pop through that door, they'll be like, oh, 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 you know, close, close the apps, make it look busy, and, and uh, you know, they'll get back to doing uh, what it is that they want to do. All right, next problem with punishment. Uh, punishment, and this is tied into to, uh, that second one. Punishment often leads you to just avoid the person who delivered the punishment. And uh, for those of you who have seen Office Space, you will know that this is one of the uh, one of the things that occurs in this. So for those of you that haven't, if you've ever thought about getting an office job or if you know somebody who has an office job, I highly recommend this comedy. Just so you know what you're probably gonna get into, uh, the benefits of PhDs and working in an environment like here at IUSB is so much better than having this. I've experienced this side of it as well. 
hopefully uh, your experiences will be different. But anyways, this is an employee, um, I forget his name, in the movie. He's about to have an interaction with his boss. He's about to have a punishment interaction with his boss. So this is an example of positive punishment. He did not do the correct cover page on his TPS reports, and now he's gonna get a talking to from his boss in the hopes that his lack of a cover page behavior is gonna decrease in the future. This is way better with volume. You see, we're putting the cover sheets on all TPS reports now before they go out. Did you see the memo about this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have the memo right here. I just uh, forgot. But uh, it's not shipping out till tomorrow, so there's no problem. Yeah. If you could just go ahead and make sure you do that from now on, that would be great. And uh, I'll go ahead and make sure you get another copy of that memo. OK? Yeah, no, I, I, I have the memo. I've got it. It's right. All right, so basically, you didn't put the cover sheet on the TPS reports. So let me present some really condescending language and treat you like a child and like you don't understand anything in the hopes that you will decrease your behavior of forgetting those TPS reports. So because Lumberg, which is the boss, has this particular style, this is what most of his employees go through. So this is a scene where it's the end of the day and... Uh, Let's see what happens. All right, so 15 minutes to the end of the day. He knows his boss uses punishment contingencies to change behavior. His boss has become a discriminative stimulus for punishment. And because of that, he is doing everything that he can to try to avoid his boss. So now he's got to come in on the weekend. Discriminative stimulus for punishment. Sure enough, when he was there, Peter got punished. He actually is going through a timeout procedure right now because he had his weekend, his weekend got taken away. Uh, that's negative punishment, that's a timeout procedure. But he has become a discriminative stimulus for punishment. And because of that, as you saw, Peter was doing everything possible to avoid him. He's doing everything possible to stay out of his way, and that's a side effect of punishment. That you will try to avoid the discriminative stimulus for punishment, you will try to avoid the punisher. And what this does is it actually decreases the uh, person who's implementing the contingency. It decreases the person who's trying to change behavior, decreases their ability to uh, implement their learning procedures. It decreases their ability to actually change behaviors because they are losing trials. If you are actively avoiding 
the discriminative stimulus for punishment, you are actively avoiding uh, your learning trials, right? You can't receive the consequences to change your behavior. It would be as if, in Harry's case, when Dr. Fox became that discriminative stimulus for punishment, if Harry just said, no, I'm not going to interact with Dr. Fox, I'm going to hide out in my room all day, well then he wouldn't have received any of the training to decrease his self-injurious behavior. So this is something that I have personally seen, uh, and this is something that will be very important to all of you as you go to grad school uh, and you're choosing your supervisor, you're choosing your program, meet with your supervisors, talk to previous graduate students, graduate students who have graduated the program and are under no influence from their, uh, from their supervisors, ask them what their style of interacting with their students are and make sure that you choose somebody who has more reinforcing strategies for guiding you through graduate school than punishment strategies. And when I was going through graduate school, thankfully, my supervisor was very reinforcing. Other people's supervisors used punishment. And I know they used punishment because I had literally seen students working in, in their labs and they would open the door, walk out into the hallway, see their supervisor and say, oh, and walk right back into their lab, shut the door and hope that they weren't seen, right? They were avoiding the discriminative stimulus for punishment. That meant that they couldn't interact with their supervisors. That meant that they couldn't get any sort of knowledge from that individual because they couldn't go through those learning trials because they were actively avoiding it. On the other hand, my supervisor used a lot of reinforcement. That was just his particular style. And because of that, when I walked out of the lab and I saw my supervisor, I didn't spin around and go back in. I was like, oh my gosh, Dr. Kennedy, hey, how's it going? And he could interact with me and he could say stuff like, oh, did you get your paper done? No, I'm still working on my paper. Well, you know, keep up the good work. Yes, I will keep up the good work, thank you very much. And you get that reinforcement trial. It's very important. You do not want to avoid the people that you're working with Punishment procedures makes the person that's getting punished want to avoid the person that is doling out the punishment. So if you're a boss, way better to use positive reinforcement to change your employees' behaviors because then they will actively seek you out and you don't have to pop up on them like uh, Lumberg here did uh, in order to catch them. They won't actively try to avoid you. All right, problem number four with punishment. Uh, punishment is likely to elicit strong emotional responses. So uh, get ready to not be liked and get ready to have very intense emotional responses if you are being, uh, if you're the person that's giving out the punishment. This is tied into uh, punishment number five. Punishment uh, can sometimes elicit an aggressive reaction. So we saw this in uh, Harry's treatment. Harry did get aggressive. Harry is a great guy. He never physically got aggressive. He never hit Dr. Fox, for example, but he tried to get into Dr. Fox's face. This was not because Dr. Fox was giving him reinforcement. This was because he was on a punishment uh, contingency. So reinforcement leads to emotional responses. We don't have to talk about those because people enjoy being reinforced. People like being reinforced. The, the emotional response is a good emotional response. Reinforcement does not lead to aggression. Nobody has ever, no child I've ever known has been rewarded with a lollipop for doing a good, uh, a good job and then punched the person, giving them the lollipop. That doesn't happen, we don't have to worry about that. So uh, again, strong emotional responses, aggressive reactions, side effects of just the punishment procedure. All right, problem number six. Uh, the use of punishment uh, through modeling and we're gonna get into observational learning uh, in a little bit. Very powerful form of learning. But the use of punishment through modeling can actually teach a person that punishment is an acceptable means of controlling behavior. So be very, very careful when you punish your children because you are literally showing them, hey, punishment is a way to change behavior. Punishment is an acceptable way. I'm doing punishment so you can do punishment. And again, this is not something that we worry about with reinforcement, right? We don't, uh, you know, we don't go to our children and say, oh my gosh, you did such a good job. 
You know, I'm so proud of you. You know, I love you so much. You know, you're a great child. And then when we're grandparents, we're watching our children with their children, and they're like, you know, oh, you did such a great job. Oh, I love you so much. Oh, you're such a great child. We don't stand there and go, where did I go wrong? What happened? Why is this? I just can't believe. You know what? That's what I did all those years ago. No, we're happy. We're happy that they're doing that. Reinforcement is typically something that we're like, we're totally fine with it. Punishment, on the other hand, not so much, right? And you can model punishment by punishing an individual. They learn, hey, this is the acceptable way of, um, you know, of, uh, of behaving. So in cases of domestic violence, you will know that oftentimes they will have a history of domestic violence in their family. The children will learn from what their parents do uh, that, again, this type of punishment is an acceptable form of controlling behavior. All right, problem number seven, I believe, yes, this is one of the last, I believe this is the last one. And this one is dangerous. Uh, it's not just something that we should be uh, aware of when we're using punishment. It makes punishment extremely dangerous if you're not aware of this one. And that is the use of punishment is actually uh, reinforced, strongly reinforced. So what this means is that punishment you can think of it as a behavior, right? The consequence of punishment. Putting somebody in timeout is a behavior that you as a punisher do, right? Spanking a child is a behavior that you as a punisher do. And that behavior in and of itself is a behavior that gets reinforced through the punishment uh, procedure. So while you're putting somebody under a contingency of punishment, they are putting you under a contingency of reinforcement. And this can oftentimes lead to punishment getting out of control. So when we see extreme, way beyond you know, the normal uh, levels of punishment uh, occurring, when we see these things occurring, we oftentimes wonder, how do these individuals get there? Like, oh my gosh, what happened? Where did these individuals uh, learn that particular behavior? And as we're gonna see, it occurs because of the punishment being reinforced. So let's take a look at this and we'll analyze it in a little bit more detail. So once again, when punishment is occurring, the person that is doling out the punishment, uh, sorry, the person receiving the punishment is on a positive punishment, we'll, we'll do positive punishment. The person receiving the punishment is on a positive punishment contingency. But that is not the only contingency that is in effect. So if we take a look at the Rodney King beatings. Rodney King was on a positive punishment contingency uh, during these beatings. So it was positive because something was presented. So the batons and the kicks uh, were presented. The behavior decreased. Okay, so again, I don't know what behavior they were trying to decrease. It could have been something as simple as uh, verticality and standing up straight. But whatever it was, the behavior decreased, that's positive punishment. So positive presents something, behavior decreases, positive punishment. And it's pretty clear that these officers were punishing Rodney King. So that's positive punishment for Rodney King. But during that exact behavior, this uh, behavior of hitting with batons, of kicking, uh, that these officers were doing was under its own contingency. And the contingency that it was under was negative reinforcement. So the beating itself was being negatively reinforced. So how is this being negatively reinforced? They had Rodney King, and this is, I want to be super clear about this, this is in no way justifying any behavior that these police officers did in any way whatsoever. But Rodney King was doing a behavior it might have been nothing more than just standing upright. It might have been nothing more than just looking them in the eye. I don't know what it was, but he was doing a particular behavior. As a consequence of that behavior, he was getting punished. As a consequence of that punishment, when they hit him with that baton, let's say that it was just him standing upright. As soon as they hit him with that baton, he went down to the floor. Something was taken away as a consequence of them hitting. As soon as they hit, something was taken away, his ability to stand up. Because of that, their behavior increases. They're more likely to hit and use excessive force in the future. 
That is negative reinforcement. So that's what we mean by saying that punishment gets negatively reinforced. The person doing the punishment gets negatively reinforced for implementing that punishment sequence. And that's why punishment has this um, tendency to just go off the rails. It has a tendency to just you know, go and uh, uh, lose uh, its, uh, its levels. So if you ever read any uh, parenting books, and you take a look at uh, how long should you put your child in timeout? How long is a good uh, amount of time for timeout? They will have a certain amount, and they will usually say something like 30 seconds uh, for every year. So if your child's three, you put them in timeout for a minute and a half. If they're five, they get two and a half minutes. You know, if they're 10, they have to sit in timeout for five minutes. The reason they're doing that is because that timeout punishment is being reinforced in the parents, right? So once, you know, if your child is just driving you crazy, they're being too loud, they're jumping on the couch, and you say, that's it, timeout, go sit in your chair, two and a half minutes, what happens? Something is taken away from your environment. The noise, the headaches, the, uh, the incessant interruptions. As a result, you putting them in timeout gets negatively reinforced, which makes you much more likely to do it more often and to do it more uh, intensely. So I use timeout for my children, and I have to adhere to that formula because there are times when they do something, and I think to myself, oh, half an hour. They're getting half an hour right now. And I have to say to myself, no, no. She's seven years old, that's three and a half. You know what I mean? Because the feeling is, is I want to do it for 30 minutes because I got reinforced. Every time I put my child in timeout, I was reinforced, negatively reinforced. So it has that chance to get off the rails like it did in this situation here. And that is also, we were talking about uh, intimate partner violence. That's also one of the reasons why intimate partner violence gets so extreme. Because while the partner is being punished, the person who is doing the violence, they are getting negatively reinforced. So you have a punishment procedure and you have that negative reinforcement as well. So let's say you look at this. So once again, we have positive punishment. So these individuals, they were doing a particular behavior that their intimate partner wanted them to decrease. And whether it was talking with a certain tone, whether it was folding the towels incorrectly, whether it was being 30 minutes late to an appointment, whatever it was, right? Whatever behavior was uh, incorrectly, let's face it, punished, it was positive punishment. Something was presented, beatings and physical violence. That behavior decreases, they start folding the towels correctly, I'll never be late again, uh, and that's positive punishment, right? Not a good thing, positive because something was presented. While that was occurring though, the person who was abusing, they were being reinforced and they were being negatively reinforced. So there was some behavior that their partner was doing that they didn't like. They gave them a slap. That behavior stopped, right? That's what happens when you get slapped, the behavior stops. So they got slapped, the behavior stops, that behavior got taken away, your slapping is gonna increase because you've just been negatively reinforced. So when punishment goes to extreme levels, it's oftentimes that because it's been negatively reinforced. And what happens with negative reinforcement is that the punishment becomes more intense, it occurs more frequently, and really it's a form of shaping. So it's the same way that you can take a student who is not very good at piano playing, and through shaping, increase their behavior until they're an expert, a concert pianist. You can take somebody who doesn't use excessive force, and through negative reinforcement, remember this change occurred because of reinforcing this behavior, through negative reinforcement of somebody who's been trained to use a certain amount of force when they're subduing uh, a suspect, they will have differing amounts of force that they use, 
If they get negatively reinforced for using a particular amount of force, then that becomes their new normal, and that can increase and increase and increase until they become the police officers that you saw in the Rodney King trials. So one of the things in the Rodney King trials that came out was, how did these people ever become police officers? How did these violent you know, abusers ever become police officers? And the answer is that they weren't violent abusers their entire life. They might have certain propensities, I'm not defending these individuals in any way, but I guarantee you they weren't doing this in police academy. I guarantee you when they were going through those training demos and they came up and they said, well, here's a suspect, why don't you try to subdue them? I guarantee you they didn't just pull out the batons and you know, start going nuts. They weren't there, but through their years on the force instituting those punishment procedures, they were re negatively reinforced for that punishment until you got to that extreme that you saw back then. So negative reinforcement is how somebody could start with an acceptable amount of punishment and end up with massively extreme forms of punishment. Same thing with uh, domestic uh, partner violence. It usually starts small, right? Most people, uh, when they start out in a relationship, you might argue, you might yell at each other a little bit, but it's small, it's a little bit, right? But you will notice that some of those behaviors will get negatively reinforced. So if you yell louder than you did before, if you call somebody a hurtful name, if you're having an argument, and you say something like, well, that's why you're stupid and everybody thinks so, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, well, I'm just gonna take some time out. You've been negatively reinforced, right? Argument was going on, you said that hurtful psychological assault, Argument ended, you've been negatively reinforced for that hurtful language. Well, what's gonna happen? That's gonna become more common and it's gonna become escalated. And then when that gets negatively reinforced, more common and more escalated. And then when that gets negatively reinforced and that gets negatively reinforced, all of a sudden you get to those high levels of abuse that are very psychologically damaging. You get to those high levels of abuse that send people to the hospital. Right? Typically, the first time that somebody gets hit physically in a relationship, they don't end up in the hospital. Not the first time. It escalates, though, as they go further through this negative reinforcement of that particular behavior. So that's how couples can get to that uh, position. And that's why when you, know, when you start off, when you talk to somebody who is going through intimate partner violence, They'll say, oh, you know what, they, they, they were never like this before. They weren't, they didn't used to be this way. It used to be nice, you know, it used to be like this. They, it, you know, they, they hit me once or twice, but it wasn't this bad, but now it's pretty bad. It escalates to this point. And again, it's because punishment is very dangerous. It can, you know, if you don't have those boundaries, it can take you to, you know, to those, uh, to those other levels. So that's why if you're in a relationship, uh, it's good to have those boundaries so that things don't get escalated. So, um, just, you know, I know in my own marriage, uh, hitting, oh my, never, not once. She doesn't hit me, I don't hit her. It's just, it's not even an option. Because, you know, it's, where's, where is the level, right? How hard, how much torque, you know, from my shoulder to my elbow, and how much, <laughs> is, how much torque do I'm gonna, am I gonna set the limit at? So set it at nothing, uh, yelling. You know, I mean, I'm human, but I, we try as much as we can not to yell in, in my house because it can just get escalated. And I know that I have been successful in this because the one time that I did yell when I was doing a, uh, I was teaching uh, Sunday school and I was pretending to be Goliath. <laughs> and I yelled about as loud as I could and my daughter was in the class and she started crying. And the teacher goes, my, my assistant goes, she's never heard you yell. And I was like, yeah, that's right. Oh my gosh, she never did. So, but again, that punishment procedure, you take it off the table. You don't use those things. You have those limits. Just the same way that you say half an hour for every year. That's how you do time out. You need to have those limits. Otherwise, you run the risk of starting here. And through those successful punishment contingencies, getting negatively reinforced until someday you're here. And you don't even know what happened, you don't even know how it got that bad. 
All right, so yeah, so punishment procedures often strongly reinforced. I think this would be a good time to uh, take stock. Any comments, any questions about anything we've covered so far about the horrors of the punishment procedures? Um, yeah. <laughs> my um, stepdad has like never raised his voice at anybody, not mm -hmm. me and my sister, not my stepbrothers. But there was one time when my older brothers, when they were like my age, they were like really loud, and he was on the phone trying to do a business call, and he yelled at them mm -hmm. because he was so flustered, and they like stopped and looked at him, and they're like complete shock because he's such a quiet person. So like docile with his. Um, uh, like parenting styles, mm -hmm. and for my sister, one time he yelled at her for the dishes. Like, mm -hmm. That's the only two times I've ever heard him like, lash out. Yep. And she like cried and like went to her room. <laughs> was like, oh my god. Yeah. So that's a great example of exactly what we were talking about. So in both those cases, the children were punished, right? Because whatever behavior they were doing, it uh, it decreased, right? It didn't it didn't occur again, um, and and your dad was negatively reinforced both times. So he was on the phone during a business call, I guess they were noisy. Yeah. <laughs> he yelled at them, the noise got taken away. That reinforced the yelling. Uh, the dishes were done, I guess, incorrectly. He yelled at his daughter, dishes were done correctly the next time, negatively reinforced. Uh, that's why it's very easy for that to escalate, and I'm, I'm sure, considering those are the only two times, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he probably told himself, Never again, right? Like, I'm not going to do that again. And uh, this, this uh, uh, just as a, another um, aside, sometimes I find myself, I was thinking like pop culture terms and, and uh, comic book terms, but do you remember the outrage uh, when uh, the first Superman, Man of Steel, came out and Henry Cavill's Superman snapped General Zod's neck and everybody was, does anybody remember that? <laughs> I mean, it's the failed DCEU, but anyways, in the first Man of Steel movie, uh, they had uh, a scene where General Zod was about to kill some people, and Superman was holding him, and Superman has this rule of, you know, I don't kill, but he had to, and he snapped General Zod's neck, and uh, you can look it up uh, on, on Google, but uh, people went ballistic. They were like, that's not Superman, that's not the way that he would do things. Uh, it was a punishment procedure, right? The reason he wouldn't do that is because in Superman's history, he has that rule, he has that bright boundary that I will not murder, I will not do that punishment procedure. And there's this great story called uh, Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow, and it's by Alan Moore, and it's a Superman story, and it answers why people were so angry, because typically uh, the, the sort of classic uh, Superman character he had to murder in that story. It was, there was no options, right? He, I'll keep it as spoiler free as I can, he just had to do it in order to save the, the world and the universe. He had to murder a particular individual. And as soon as he did it, he was in his fortress of solitude. As soon as he did it, he opened up the door to where the gold kryptonite was uh, kept. And he walked in there and closed it, knowing that that would remove all of his powers. He literally said, I can't be Superman anymore because I've crossed this line. And he knows that, even Superman as a character knows, that uh, you know, he's been positively, he's been negatively reinforced for that murder. That makes him more likely to murder in the future. That makes him even more likely to murder after that. Who's gonna stop Superman? Nobody. So he walks into the gold chamber, has his powers directly removed, and that's why people hated that particular scene, because they're like, that's not what Superman would do. All right, I gotta do more lectures on Superman. <laughs> Okay, so uh, what we're going to end with uh, today, just so that we don't think it's all doom and gloom, just so that we don't think it's all horrible in terms of punishment, we've got to be aware of the side effects, but importantly, we don't want to throw out uh, punishment entirely because there are benefits uh, to punishment. Where'd you go, benefits? There are benefits to punishment. <laughs> Incidentally, the fact that I don't run videos off of, my, uh, off of my tablet anymore, that's an example of uh, negative punishment. So I originally had the behavior of trying to run videos on my tablet. 
The videos were taken away, they never worked. My behavior of running them on the tablet decreased and that's why I run it on the computer. That's a little aside. Anyways, benefits of punishment. There are benefits of punishment. We'll talk about a few of them. Benefit number one, uh, and this is weird, right? You wouldn't think of this, but punishment can sometimes lead to an actual increase in social behavior. It can actually lead to an increase in people's engaging with you. So if you've ever punished somebody, for example, if you punished a child, oftentimes that child wants nothing more than to increase social interaction with you. To do a social interaction that says, you know what, we're good, we're fine, we're okay. Right? If you give your friend the silent treatment, and you're punishing them, and you're like, you know what, I can't even speak to you right now. All your friend wants to do is speak to you, right? All they want to do is like, just let me apologize, just let me give you a hug, let me, you know, give you this uh, societal signal that we're okay. And uh, that's what uh, occurs. So in, uh, in nature, this is thought to have an evolutionary basis. Uh, in nature, um, animals in a specific species, right, in, in, a, uh, in a single species, will often fight. They'll often fight for territory, they'll often fight for uh, resources, and uh, you know, you see this when, if you ever, uh, I've seen a video of mountain goats just butting heads over the fact that they're on the same, you know, slope, and they want the slope and the other one doesn't. And they just keep butting heads and butting heads and butting heads. It would be a disadvantage, an evolutionary disadvantage for that species if they butted heads until one of them was dead and the other one was so severely maimed that it would live for about another week before it died, right? No goat offspring, no, you know, carrying on of the genes, evolutionary disadvantage. So what often happens is that they go through this punishment procedure and eventually one of them will say, you know what, I've had enough. And once they've had enough, one of them will do appeasement behaviors is what they're called. So they will basically kind of bow down, put their head down to the ground, and that is your signal to say, you know what, you've won, I don't need to get injured any further, take the territory, here's my societal um, behavior that indicates that everything is okay. So this type of behavior is what the human hug is all about. The hug is the opposite of fighting. So when you think about fighting, if somebody's gonna fight you, what do you do? You start protecting yourself. You put your hands close together, you protect your soft underbelly, you put your hands up to protect your face, you get into that fighting stance. A hug is a horrible fighting stance because you're completely open. That's what happens when somebody has won the fight. So if you have somebody, let's say that you're dealing with uh, a child in school, let's say that you're a teacher, and you have a child, and that child just doesn't want to interact with you, that child just doesn't really seem very engaged, uh, you might try punishing that child for an inappropriate behavior that they did in the hopes that that could trigger this increase in societal behavior. Hoping that, hoping that because of that punishment, that child will then open up socially to you and basically say, because of this evolutionary response that we have, basically say, oh my gosh, I got punished, I should do an appeasement behavior, let me go forth and, and uh, you know, socially interact with uh, my teacher, let her know that I get it, I don't want to be punished anymore, everything is uh, all right. So uh, incidentally, this is, uh, this ties in, and we'll, we'll wrap it up here, but I just want to um, uh, bring up another example of this uh, societal uh, behaviors, or these, these appeasement behaviors. There's been a really uh, interesting study done um, that just came out about uh, why uh, men don't say sorry as much as, as women do. So, you know, a lot of, uh, I just watched uh, a film the other day where a woman was telling another woman, don't say sorry so much, right? And the person will be like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And she's like, don't you dare say that you're sorry. And she's like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. And they're like, no, 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 don't say you're sorry. So why do women say sorry in our society so much? Why do men say sorry so difficult? Uh, so so much, so much more difficulty. I'll leave the men one alone for now. For women, they found that the meaning of sorry for women is very different than the meaning of sorry for men. And what the meaning of sorry for women means? It means that I don't like the fact that we're arguing, and I would like it to stop. I want to be friends again. 
So there's no cost to saying sorry when you're a woman. For males, it's a serious undertaking of responsibility that oftentimes leads to much cost, much loss of social status, much loss of reparations. It's basically saying, I did something wrong, and I am going to make up for it. I am personally going to take care of it. I am going to sacrifice my resources to make sure that the situation is OK. For women, it's more, I don't like where our relationship is right now. I would like our relationship to get back to where it is. So if you punish somebody, that simple act of punishment would lead you to say, you know what, let me just go out there and say I'm sorry. I'm going to interact with this person because I want our relationship to go back. I want to signal to them, I am done with this behavior, punishment received, we're all good, and it can actually lead to an increase in a particular social behavior. All right, so we got two more benefits to punishment that we're going to take a look at next time. Any final questions, comments about anything we looked at today? All right, so if there's nothing else, that is uh, it for today.